Well, good afternoon, everyone. And I wanted to give the Health and Social Care Minister a break from today's briefing. He's doing the rest of the briefings this week with either myself or colleagues, and I'm sure he will be watching, checking to make sure we do it properly. I am, however, delighted to have Dr Alex Allenson, Minister of Education, Sport and Culture, and Mrs Chrissy Callaghan, who is a Schools Improvement Officer, who will update us about nurseries and childminders. First of all, today's numbers. The total number of tests undertaken is 5,282. We have had 5,252 tests returned, which means that there are 30 outstanding. There have been 336 confirmed cases. There are no new cases today, meaning that we are now on day 19 of no new cases, and we have no active cases. We continue to have excellent results, and I'm grateful to you all for this. It has been a team effort. Please take a moment to realise the significance of what we have achieved as an island. Now, the Council of Ministers met this morning, and I have three issues that arose from that meeting to update you on. And I would like to look ahead briefly to the Council of Ministers meeting too on Thursday. Before I do so, I would like to hand over to the Minister of Education, Sport and Culture for an update. Alex. Thank you, Chief Minister. The Department of Education, Sport and Culture has been working closely with teachers and other key staff to allow the island's children to return to their schools. On Monday the 15th, all our schools will reopen and those pupils currently in the hubs will return to their own local school on the 17th. From Monday the 22nd of June, all Year 2 and Year 6 pupils and Year 10 and 12 students will be able to return to their own school full-time. I've been contacted by many parents anxious about whether their children will be able to get back to school before the end of this term. I'd like to apologise for any uncertainty and recognise that parents want to have definite dates to plan around. A large amount of work has been done preparing schools. Classrooms have been altered, hand washing facilities installed and enhanced cleaning regimes devised to ensure our schools are safe places for all pupils and staff. I would like to thank Mrs Fiona Fitzpatrick for a letter she sent to me today which included a range of questions from many parents who have been discussing their children's education online. She asked us to publish a clear plan to enable all children to return to their schools by the end of July. Next week we will be in a much better position to make sure our schools have the capacity to do this. Classes will be smaller and more self-contained, staff have been redeployed and lunchtime staggered. Whilst I know New Zealand has abandoned the need for social distancing, on the Isle of Man we need to keep our guard up at this time and make sure we are prepared for any recurrence of the virus. But we will be reviewing this guidance to schools with public health and if the, sit if the health situation remains stable, we'll accelerate the intention to allow reception and Year 9 children to return, followed by Years 1, 4 and 8 and shortly afterwards 3, 5 and 7. Another question was about developing a plan to manage remote learning. The current health emergency has amplified existing differences between schools' use of online educational resources. A lot of development has been done in a short period of time, and I would like to thank teachers for all the work they've put towards supporting parents during this difficult period. We need to share best practice and introduce a more coherent approach so that every parent knows what they can expect from their school. One of the most important questions was about the effect the closure of schools not only had on a child's education, but also potentially on their social development and mental health. Children will need to be reassured when they come back into the classroom, and teachers will need to spend time exploring their experiences and getting them used to being able to mix again with their friends. The Safer Schools app has been updated to help with this transition, and psychological support is available if needed. At the start of the pandemic, there were no questions that schools needed to close. But now we are about to reopen them, there are many more questions about how pupils will be kept safe and their educational needs met. I will be working with teachers to ensure they have the necessary guidance, resources and backing they need to teach and support the children of our island. From today, nurseries and childminders will start welcoming more young children back into their care, and I would like to introduce Chrissy Callahan from the department to outline the plans already in place to restart these services. Thank you, Minister, and good afternoon, everyone. 
We have over 50 registered nurseries and playgroups and 75 registered childminders on the island at present. And I'd like to start off by offering a huge thank you to all of those practitioners who work within the childcare sector on our island. Within our nurseries, playgroups and childminder settings, we have a wonderful group of dedicated, caring and enthusiastic practitioners. As I'm sure you'll appreciate, with the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic, this has been an extremely challenging, emotional and worrying time for childcare providers, as well as for families and their children. We were all plunged into a new world without much warning and had to adapt quickly and continue to adapt as an ever-changing normal. Some providers have remained open throughout this time to care for the children of other key workers and are to be commended for being so flexible, resourceful and resilient in continually adapting the practice within their settings in order to ensure the safety and well-being of children within their care. Other providers have remained closed during this time for a variety of reasons. However, many of these settings have continued to keep in contact and maintain a relationship with the children and their families during this time through the power of technology. For those preschool children due to transition into school in September, this would have been the term for visits into school and meeting the staff from the nurseries, playgroups and childminders and for staff to meet up with teachers to carefully plan this transition. Many providers and schools have already started to do this remotely in a range of creative ways, and this will continue over the summer term in order to continue to prepare your child for school. At present, we have 15 nurseries and one before and after school provider open and 35 childminders caring for between 190 and 200 children a week. This continues to grow. These providers have been supported during this time by the Early Years Advisory Team at the Department of Education, Sport and Culture and the Inspection Team from the Department of Health and Social Care's Registration and Inspection Unit. This has included the development of a comprehensive guidance document to support those providers who are beginning to reopen and those who've remained, those who've remained closed to gradually expand their provision. This is being followed up by a webinar for the childcare sector hosted by the Chamber of Commerce on Wednesday evening, where providers can ask additional questions, having read the guidance. As you will have heard during the Chief Minister's press conference last Thursday, access to childcare is opened up to the children of those parents within the retail sector from today and will be available to all children on Monday the 15th of June. However, this does not mean that all children will be able to return to their nursery, playgroup or childminder on the 15th of June. This would not be practical, safe or in the best interests of the staff or children in their care. Each setting will determine what works best for them and plan a carefully phased return for the children in their care. As we know, all children are different. And you may find that some children make that transition back into their setting more easily, leaving their parents with a quick kiss or a hug, whilst others may need more support. For some children, being at home for such an extended period of time without their normal routines may mean that they experience some anxiety on separating from their parents or indeed socialising with other children. We would like to ask parents to acknowledge and understand that this mean that may mean that some children would be phased back into their childcare setting over a longer period of time, but that this is in the best interest of their child and, and the staff in the setting. Please work with the nursery, playgroup and childminder that your child attends in order to ensure that this process is as smooth as possible. The earlier sector identifies that young children cannot be expected to socially distance a baby needs a cuddle. A toddler may need that gentle re piece of reassurance. And much of the early years development relies on the interactions and close connections with both adults and other children, which is essential for their well-being and development. The emphasis for this age group is the grouping of children and staff into smaller bubble groups and a focus on enhanced hygiene routines and cleaning. This has meant a lot of planning and preparation behind the scenes by providers in order to ensure these protocols are in place. I would also like to ask parents to support providers by keeping your children at home if they have a temperature or COVID-like symptoms, or to collect your child from your nursery playgroup or childminder if they develop a temperature or fall ill during the day when asked to do so by staff. If you are in any doubt, keep your child at home 
and call the COVID helpline. If you need further help and support, this way we will ensure the, the safety of everyone and continue to make the remarkable progress we have done on our island. In conclusion, I would like to give a big shout out to all of those people working in our nurseries, playgroups and childminders. You are our early years superheroes. We have an early years sector to be proud of. Thank you for everything you do for the children and families on our island. Thank you very much, Chrissy. Today sees the opening of applications for preschool credits, which is another way the government is supporting working families. Parents can apply online at the government website or submit a written application at either the Welcome Centre or the department headquarters in Douglas. And I'd now like to hand back you back to the Chief Minister. Well, thank you very much, Chrissy, and thank you very much, Alex. As I said in Timbald last week, there is a tough balance to get right here. I know that some parents are frustrated that their children may not be able to go back to, to full-time education and straight away after half term. And I understand that. The department and our head teachers are working hard to provide as much information as possible. Equally, there are parents who are not ready to send their children back. And I understand that also. This is why we have made attendance optional until the next school year. Turning to other issues, there were two decisions at this morning's Council of Ministers that I would like to share with you. First, regarding compassionate travel. While the border remains closed, as you will know, we have sought to help those people with genuine and urgent compassionate cases to make the journeys that they need. Today, we agreed that we would broaden the guidance on the types of compassionate reasons that we can consider. The period of 14 days quarantine will remain in place and prior permission will have to be obtained. People have, of course, never been prevented from leaving the island. It has been the return that we have had to regulate in order to prevent anyone unwillingly and unwittingly bringing the virus back with them. From the 11th of June, we will slightly change the categories to allow Manx residents to travel and return for overriding personal, family or health requirements. This could now, for example, include child visitation, support for an unwell parent, etc. We will also consider applications from non-Manx residents to travel to the island in order to provide support for elderly, frail or otherwise vulnerable residents. This would also cover anyone who needs to travel to the island to deal with the estates of deceased Manx family members. Please let me repeat, exemptions in any of these categories will require prior clearance from the Cabinet Office repatriation team and the 14-day quarantine period will remain on return. The second thing from the Council of Ministers meeting about which I would like to brief you is the decision and the discussion we had about our plan to bring to an end the emergency period. In Timbald on Friday, I told members that as we emerge out of the health emergency, we also need to emerge out of the emergency powers we currently have in place. The powers were brought in for a reason. As government, we needed the ability to move quickly and decisively to deal with the threat of the virus. But like so much relating to COVID, existing from the emergency or exiting from the emergency is far more complex than getting into it. We want to get to a place as soon as possible where we can ask the Lieutenant Governor to lift the emergency. But when he does, all the powers in place will fall. Now, while we are ready for some to fall, others remain important to keep our people safe. If the emergency period ended tomorrow, we would, for example, lose the ability to maintain our borders closed and to require people to quarantine when they return. We have come up with a way to put some of the powers we need to maintain into existing legislation. Others will be put into temporary regulations that will allow those powers we do need for a little longer, but should not need in the long term. We will be working with all Timble members on this plan ahead of a proper debate next week. If members agree, we will be able to invite the Lieutenant, Lieutenant Governor to lift the emergency. He may need to extend the state of emergency a little longer while we put this important plan in place. 
exiting the emergency period as soon as possible is the right thing to do. But we need to make sure we retain the ability to continue to protect our island and, if necessary, to deal with any future outbreaks. And thirdly, a point of clarification on churches and other places of worship. The Council of Ministers has agreed some time ago that we would no longer dictate how they went about their business. It is for each religious institution to decide for themselves when and how they reopen. Just before I take questions, I would like to take a quick look at the week ahead. This is all, of course, subject to change. The next briefing will be on Wednesday, where the Minister of Health and Social Care will be taking questions directly from the public. These are proving to be very popular. The Education Minister did one last week, and if you are interested in taking part in this, please email COVID-19 Community Support at gov.im, all in lower case. I will be back on Thursday with the Health and Social Care Minister to brief you on the outcome of the Council of Ministers meeting. And I hope to be able to bring you an update on the changes that will happen on the 15th of June, including the reset of our social distancing guidance. Friday, we'll see the Health Minister back in the hot seat, supported by Catherine Megson, the Chief Executive of the Department of Health and Social Care. And I'll now take questions. And first and foremost is Leanne from 3FM. Good afternoon, Leanne. Good afternoon, Chief Minister. Um, my first question, just looking for a bit of clarification, please. I know you've mentioned with easing restrictions, potentially allowing more residents to return to the Isle of Man. If they go into shared accommodation, does each resident of that accommodation have to quarantine with them for the first two weeks? Yes, absolutely. If you go to your house and you're, if you're a student returning and your parents are there or any family member is in that house, then you, the, the entire family must quarantine with you for 14 days. That means they cannot go out out of the house other than into their garden. So obviously I, I've known cases where with family at home they've decided because they didn't want the family members to quarantine, they've um, maybe booked a, a holiday cottage or something. But yes, they still have, the whole family have to quarantine. Okay, thank you. And my second question, I just wondered if you could clarify the current procedure for prison visits, because I know Mr Ashford announced last week that hospital visits are, are now allowed under exceptional circumstances. Right, that's um, out of my pay grade, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm not knowledgeable on that topic. So what I'll, I'll um, ensure is that on Wednesday, um, when um, Mr Ashford is doing the interaction, that we will um, give you a full update on that, Leanne. It, it's not something I, I could give you a, a clear answer. So I'll pass on that. So if you want another question to hit me with, that'll be great. OK, thank you. OK, we move on to Amanda Cashmore from Jeff the Mongoose. Amanda. Good afternoon. My first question is for Dr. Allen, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, you mentioned New Zealand in your speech and how yeah. it's abandoning social distancing and said we need to handle it differently on the island. Can you give more detail as to why this is and why, after having a longer period of time without new cases than New Zealand, the island is not allowing all children to return back to school and permit life to return to a semblance of normality? Absolutely. I mean, New Zealand's been very effective in terms of closing their borders very, very quickly at a very much earlier stage than, than we did, perhaps. They've also managed to develop a test and trace and, co and contact tracing, as we have done as well. So there are quite a few similarities there. What is different, though, I think, on the Isle of Man is that we're dealing with a lot of fear, a lot of apprehension here from, from parents who are looking at the adjacent island and seeing things that are happening there. And so we've always said that we would approach the reopening of schools in a gradual, phased way so that we put educational needs above everything else and we look after those children. I am hoping as we progress through this period, if the situation um, in terms of their health and Nobles Hospital remains the same, we can accelerate that. And the Council of Ministers are reviewing a lot of the restrictions we've got on a weekly basis. So I'm hoping that by the time we get to the 15th, we can perhaps um, relax them a little bit more. But at the moment, we, the plan is to have social distancing down to one metre or arm's length. Schools have been working alongside, alongside those guidelines with a lot of help from public health. And this restricts the capacity we've got in our schools. What we've been trying to do is having class, class sizes, which are about 50% of what they were. But that means we've got to have 
twice as many classrooms and twice as many teachers or teacher support to do that. And so I think what we'll be seeing over the next few weeks is an acceleration of the return, but not a sudden flood of people back into the school at a time when we still need to develop that confidence for parents and the staff of the schools to cope with the increased number of pupils coming through the doors. Thank you very much. And secondly, a question for you, Chief Minister, if I may. Um, some doctors in Italy have reported that the virus is now much less aggressive than it was a few weeks ago. Does the government and its advisers think it's credible that the virus could be becoming much less dangerous? It's not a conversation I've had with our Director of Public Health or, or our medics on this one, Amanda. I'm, I'm sure they will be monitoring the, the, the situation as, as they regularly do. For example, I think it was Italy that showed that if you are, were immune suppressant or, or taking um, cancer drugs, then it could increase your mortality chances by five. So we have learned from the feedback from um, Italy and, and other countries too to see what's happened there and, and can we learn and improve um, the situation for the people of, of the Isle of Man as a result. I will ask that question to see if they have considered. I'm sure they have, but it's not something that they've informed me at this moment in time, Amanda. Thank you very much, Chief Minister. Thank you very much. Next, we have Paul Moulton from MTTV. Paul. Thank you, Chief Minister. As you know, there's going to be a demonstration planned in Douglas tomorrow uh, while you're having your sitting of the House of Keys. This uh, appears still to be against the regs uh, under the emergency powers, and there may be a demonstration about the demonstration. Um, what will happen, I suppose, is, is the question, because um, it's not meant to happen, but it, it could happen, and what are you expected to do about it? Well, as I said last week, Paul, it's not for government to approve or deny a protest. You know, this is an operational matter for the police. It's for them to determine what is acceptable and deal with it accordingly. Now, well, of course, myself and all members of the government support the Black Lives Matter um, gathering or, or the members of the public wanting to show their support on that i would ask people to think we are still in the middle of a coronavirus outbreak okay we haven't got any active cases on the isle of man but if we have large numbers at this protest i would just ask people to to think about their social distancing and is it right for, for them to be there we all share the the um, support that they are they are showing themselves but i, I think there are ways to do it re responsibly responsibly and would just ask them to be very careful and considered for all the people that are around them. Sorry, I thought we still were under the situation where we weren't meant to have gatherings of any large sizes. This will be a large gathering. Yeah, but it's politicians, Paul, cannot interfere with, with policing, um, whether it be on the Isle of Man or, or, or anywhere in the United Kingdom. Um, so I cannot tell the police Chief Constable, this is not to happen. Obviously, I, I've had a number of emails from people who are concerned about the, the um, gathering um, be, because of the coronavirus issues, but it is not for me as a politician to instruct the Chief Constable that he is not to allow it to go ahead. That is for him to decide, and if he feels he can police it to the satisfaction of all the rules and regulations out there, then that's, that is his decision, Paul, and I have okay. to respect that. And for Minister of Education, um you, you had this um, clause about uh, coughing in schools and that sort of thing, which didn't go well in two. I'd like your take on, on why that was in there, and obviously you, you, you changed your mind, right? Um, I, I, I did change my mind. Unfortunately, Tim Will didn't support the, the motion going forward. And, and the motion well, it was about more than just coughing and spitting. It was about the obligations on schools at the moment, according to the 2001 Education Bill, that they have to do PE, that they have to have assemblies, that they have to have religious worship. And what it was trying to do was to say, in this very difficult period, we would relax those obligations on teachers to have to provide this. It was also trying to make a clear statement that if a suspended pupil or a parent or some, somebody who was unauthorised to go into a school went in and deliberately spat or coughed in, in the face of, of, of a member of staff, that was not going to be tolerated. That was going to be seen as, as, as an offence in the 2001 Act. Now, Tim Wald had some problems with that and, and there's some disagreement and I, I'm very disappointed that they didn't support it. But that, that's what democracy is about. That's why we brought this, this motion to Tim Wald. Um, what we're going to be doing now as a department is working through the existing legislation to reassure those teachers, reassure those skill, the schools that they can have some flexibility in how they provide education and make sure it's in a safe way. 
Um, so we won't be bringing a motion back because that wasn't agreed by Tim Wald, but we'll be working around the current legislation, working with the schools to make them as safe as possible, but also give teachers that flexibility so that they can actually teach um, in a sensible way once more children come back into the schools. Thank you. Okay. I think it's fair to say the majority of Tim Wald members actually did support Dr. Allenson. Um, it was just the houses were divided. The House of Keys supported Dr. Allenson the members of the Legislative Council on a 5-4 split didn't um, support Dr. Allenson and therefore it, it, it fell. It was disappointing, but we have to respect the outcome of that and, and move on. Right, next question we have is from Sam Turton, Alamein Newspapers. Good afternoon, Sam. Good afternoon, Chief Minister. Um, <clears throat> with people planning towards more staycations this summer, I understand the idea has been floated of working some sort of agreement in with our Channel Island uh, friends, is that something that is being discussed at government level? Well, Sam, we, we have looked at it because obviously Jersey, Guernsey, Sark um, haven't had any cases, but they're obviously very, very small, um, are in a similar position. Guernsey, similar number of days with no cases. Jersey, um, a little bit behind us, but not far away. But really, this isn't a, a government for, for government to decide. It's for travel agents and, and tour operators to see if they feel that there's a business there to have corridors um, between the, the three islands, then I'm, I'm sure government would look favourably on that. But it really is, it's, you know, government cannot become a, a travel agent effectively. It's, if someone wants to do that, then we'll, we'll do our utmost through the Department for Enterprise, Sam, to help them with that. Thank you. Just secondly, for uh, Dr. Allenson, Obviously, with um, a lot of students who were in the year 11 and year 13 will have been getting to the stage around, they would have been getting exam results uh, in the coming weeks and months. Do we have an update on how that's going to work for them this year and when they may be able to do resits? Um, that's a very good question. And at the start of the, this um, health emergency, there was a lot of uncertainty about exams. What we've now got is a clear commitment that Isle of Man students will be treated exactly the same on a level playing field with their United Kingdom counterparts. So those awards will be based very much on the coursework that they've done, but also the teachers' assessments. And teachers are already working on that so that they get, they get the grades that they deserve. But there'll also be the ability to resit if they're not happy with those grades or for those pupils who, who want the chance to prove themselves quite physically, the chance to resit those exams um, in October. And what we'll be doing with the schools is helping to support those pupils who need to resit the, those exams and make sure it, it happens in, in, a, in an orderly manner for them and they get the reassurance about what they'll need to do to pass, get the grades they need to move on to the next stage in their education. So just as a more, slightly more technical point, if I may, um, Often with resits, it relies on the parents or the, the you know of the um, child to pay for resit examinations. Is the department we looking to waive that later in the year, given what has happened this year? Absolutely, we're going through extraordinary times, and I know that pupils and, and students are under a huge amount of pressure and stress. Um, at a time of pressure and stress anyway, this is just compounded to it. And certainly the department will be working with those schools, identifying those students who need to do resits or who want to do resits, and help them as much as possible, including financially. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Sam. And last but not least, Alex Bell from the BBC. Alex. Thank you. A uh, question for the Education Minister first, please. Um, you said there about the gradual return of children in all years to school. Did you say that would be by the end of July where you have to have schools ready for all children to return? Well, the, the, the term ends at the end of July, so we need to, to try to get as many children back to their schools as possible. Um, what we've been doing is working with the teachers to look at the, the, the layout of classrooms, look at the layout of schools, we're still not quite sure how many of some of the other years will want to come back. Schools have been surveying their pupils, particularly the year 10 and 12 um, and 2 and 6, to see how many of them will want to come back. And as I said, there will be reduced capacity in the schools as we start because of social distancing, e even with the amendments we've made to that and hope to institute on the 15th. But the in intention will be that all those students who want to go back to school, we will try to get them back to school during July so that at least they can reacclimatize, they can try to catch up on what they need to do. And also we can make plans for over the summer for allowing them to use online resources and other ways of catching up with any, any educational deficits that have been inflicted on them because of the lockdown over the last few months. Well, you've led into my next question there. 
given the long weeks that many children have had away from school, are there any plans to change the dates for the summer holidays or indeed any of the other holidays next year? There aren't definite plans at the moment because a lot of parents plan um, the summer around the, the, the school year. Um, and obviously that, that's been set out and been published already. What we will be doing though as schools reopen is looking at how we can perhaps work around some of those issues but also we've already started work in terms of summer schools that will be provided by Manx Sport and Recreation. Now usually those are just sporting but this year we need to concentrate also on the well-being of children to help them reacclimatize themselves to being back in schools, to have more structure, to deal with any conduct issues that may be um, present because they've been isolated for so long. And we're doing quite a bit of work at the moment to develop a whole program which will be available for young people over the summer months to help support them, but also support their families. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Now, Leanne, before I finish, I, I wasn't able to answer your second question because I didn't have the information, so I don't know if you'd like to hit me with another question to make up for it, or are you okay? Uh, no, I'm okay. Thank you, Chief Minister. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you, and um, two shout-outs for today. Now, first, following National Volunteering Week, this weekend saw National Specials Weekend marked by police forces across the United Kingdom, paying tribute to the special constables who give up their own free time to volunteer as police officers. The Isle of Man is lucky to have a dedicated team of special constables who I know give huge amounts of their time each year helping our constabulary and keeping our community safe. Their contribution has been particularly valued over the past few months. Thank you very much. The second is for the Big Manx Community Project who have put together a wonderful tribute to the amazing strength of our island community during COVID-19. It's called Howard's Heroes and it is set to the tune of the Laxey Wheel song. Well done to everyone involved in producing this and for the money raised for worthy causes. We will play the video at the end of this briefing, so do stick around to watch it. So thanks to the Big Manx Community Project and thanks to all of you for getting us to where we are. You are amazing. Keep on making the right decisions for you and your loved ones. It's not over yet, but we are getting there. Have a great week and please stay safe. Thank you all very much.